came to our apartment she had, she was married, she had a one bedroom apartment. One night my brother slept on the couch, I slept on the floor. The next night, vice versa. Again, in the outflow, I found a job in a machine shop and I started to work in a machine shop and my brother went with my uncle who lived in the town of was in the American Army. He worked for Swing Line, a stable machine, and he started to work there. And soon as we got a couple of dollars, I rented a room for eight dollars a week and my brother moved in with my uncle because he only had room. He also had to sleep with him, he wasn't married. And it was not easy for us. I came home with twenty-eight dollars a week. I had to pay eight dollars for the room that left me $20 for the week to eat. And after a while, there was a club called McAfee, a soccer club we joined. And we saw at night there was a ferry running from 125th over to New Jersey in Palisade Park. And a bunch of fellas went there. And come on, Walter. I didn't go. Why didn't I go? I couldn't afford a quarter to go over the bridge. The next morning, where I had the room, uh, the family lived around in the same building on the same floor. The, the son came over to me and said to me, Walter, why didn't you come along? The little the time I spoke a little broken English, I said, I couldn't afford to go. I said, I went home and I cried. We could have stood in our house. The German offered us money to start the business. We told them, take your Germany and shove it. We ain't, where were you when we all left? Did you say anything? But then we, st uh, we had an uncle who was in the meat line, not kosher, and they started to work there. Okay, um, we're gonna hold here. We're gonna rotate again of the students. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sit. And 
actually, real quick, I'm going to double check for this. So, give me one second. Yep, that's it. That's a good idea. You should also. Yeah, I know I'm saying. Things how it is. If something pops out to you, write down, write down, write down, pops to you like when you said it, and write down like the first thing you would say. If anything pops out to you, that's all you do. Okay, we're good with that, so we're gonna go back to that. I'm gonna do a sound check for her. You good? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that how you're gonna talk? You need to talk louder. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. Mr. Spear, can you please count to ten? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. Yeah? Great. And if that's the case, bring in the slate. There you go. Right here? A little lower. Perfect. Ten. Wait, I broke it. Oh, wow. It's okay, I did that too. That's okay. Just open, open up the top. Cool. Okay, good? Yep. Names, not numbers, Frisch. Walter Spear, take four. Mr. Spear, my name is Michal. If we could just go back to during the war. When you arrived at Auschwitz, did you receive a number? A eighteen thirty eight. And when you received the number, what what emotions did you feel? You were brainless. You didn't know. You were totally brainless. It's hard to explain, but literally you were brainless because uh, you didn't know what went on. You you saw your parents being killed and you were separated from your brother. You didn't know what's going on in the outside world. You were hungry, you were cold, you were miserable. And during the wartime, did you have any moments that, that gave you hope for in any way? Well, like I said a couple of weeks ago, when you say Tachnun on Monday and Thursday, where you say, I can't my, where you say, God, I always stood with you. Now don't forget me. That's what you had. You had hopes that you, you, you said to yourself, you closed your eyes, you thought, you thought the way your mother baked the uh, crumb cake and other cakes and you ate and you, 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 I can't explain it how you feel about it. It's not an easy, but that lifted you up and the way you were brought up and the way you live now, you couldn't imagine that people uh, could go like that, uh, kill uh, children, kill uh, human beings. We saw it, and uh, you, you were hardened. And after a while, it didn't bother you. Should couldn't say bother you, but it didn't affect you that much anymore. You get used to callers. What was um, real quick before you continue your next question? Can you just show me the? I'm gonna get a close up of your arm if you can just show it to me one more time, and then after that, we'll do it. it's fading away a little. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. What was the religious experience like for you in the camps? I'm sorry? The religious experience like for you? Like Shabbos or any holidays, davening? When in camp? In the camps. You the didn't war. know. You didn't know what day it was. You didn't know what holiday it was. You didn't know. You'd, even you could, like, you could say, if it's a full moon or something, but you didn't even think of religion. Anybody who tells you, it's hard to believe. I didn't. And the people I was with, they didn't think. Even the ones where we talked to after the war or year, 
You didn't think of a holiday. You didn't think. So you just mentioned that in the camps you didn't believe. How did you come back to being religious after the... Well, like I said, I started to work for a particular relative of mine, of ours, I should say, in the Trevor Line, and came, uh, we came here in June, and this already was uh, the end of August or was September, I don't know, came uh, before Rosh Hashanah, the foreman came and uh, said, you got to pull matches. Now, I forgot long or short. If you pull one, you got to come in the second day and you get a paid for the first day. If you don't pull, you don't get paid. And I'm standing like that. When it came to me, he says, you don't pull. So I whispered in my ear, I'm proud of you. And I knew I didn't want to stay there. In the meantime, I met my lovely wife. We got married. And thank God we were married for 66 years. And you're talking about kosher. Once we got, I got our census together. We started, we got married. We started our kosher home. And, uh, We got married, and we got uh, we had two sons, and they married two wonderful girls, and between the two of them, they gave us five excellent grandchildren, and one of them is sitting here, and we are very proud, and we have six great grandchildren. Like I said earlier, a lot of times. God punished me, but he made it up later on in life and gave me a wonderful family. How did it feel for you when you were able to reunite with the, with the remainder of your family, your sister and your brother? I'm sorry? When you, when you reunited with your sister and your brother in the United States, like, can you describe how you were feeling? Good question. It was very emotional at first, and you talked about what was, and we were happy that we were together, but our parents weren't with us, couldn't guide us, just like me. I came here, I was 17 and a half, Nobody told me what to do, how to do, but I knew that we came from a Orthodox home. We were brought up the right way, and like my father said, be proud of our name. Like uh, coming, uh, jumping a little bit ahead, or uh, let's go back for one minute, when I was liberated and I left Mauthausen, I said earlier, someday I'm going to come back. And while I was working, I started, after a while, my own business, a kosher butcher shop, strictly kosher. And when I retired, I called my two sons and I said, you know, when I was liberated, I made myself a promise, someday I'm going to come back. I said, here, you tell us the time and the place, and we go. We went, I couldn't go to Auschwitz. We went to Czechoslovakia, and we went to Mauthausen, and my wife also comes from Germany, and we went to five cemeteries. After a year or so, my grandson says, why don't you take us? 
So thank God we have five grandchildren, but we couldn't get them all together. So we went with our three grandson, JC, and his two cousins. We went the same way. And even so, when we went to our town and I knocked on one door and I here there came out a man, I don't know if you know if you remember the Marx brothers, full of hair, no teeth, nothing. And I told him who I was and he says Valda. He was a kid and he remembered the place where they took us away. And he says, I can't believe it. And JC can, can tell you the story someday. So coming back, like, thank God we were successful in business. And after, in between, I became active in the synagogue, Mount Sinai Jewish Center, where we still live. And we're still not as active anymore. We have a lot of young people. And I was the president for 10 years there, so I must have done something right. And after a while, I gave up, and uh, we enjoy life and our family. When you went back with your children, your grandchildren, what message were you trying to teach them or show them? What I, well, number one, I want to show them where we came from, where we lived, and uh, like I said in the beginning, if every German would have been a Nazi, nobody would have come out. Like. Uh, there were the good ones, we were uh, unbelievable. They wanted to make good what their forefathers did bad. Like two years ago, no more than that, we were, we were going to Germany and they put in front of the Jewish homes, they put Stolpersteiner. What is Stolpersteiner? Here was a Jewish family. Here is the house. And on, on the street, the duck holes, and they put names on there that here lived so-and-so, so-and-so. And they put a heavy glass on it, and they see it. And that's why we went back. And uh, was also very emotional. And uh, two years ago, we went back again and we spoke about, I don't know, 200 or something high school students, like here. And uh, they want, number one, they never saw a Jew before. They never uh, uh, saw a Holocaust survivor. And uh, they couldn't believe what went on. And also they asked questions, I spoke, just like what went on. And uh, uh, they, like I said, they couldn't believe. And on the end, they went on the stage, and as they turned around, they had the letters on each one, never again. So uh, it's... Uh, It's hard to prescribe, like when we were there, where the synagogue was, like I said, that was destroyed. There was a stone, which I should say different, where the synagogue was. Now, I don't know if the property of the synagogue was sold or not. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But who took a role was a Nazi. And the Nazi sold the property to that, his house to that family. And once she found out that there was a synagogue, they uh, 
she made like a garden out of it, and she's going to put up a sign in German, naturally, that here was the synagogue, blah, blah, blah. And I would love to go one more time back, but my dear wife wouldn't let me. When you tell over your story to children or anyone, what's that like for you? Well, there is, I heard once, I'm sure you heard of him better than I do. There is uh, the famous Rabbi Lau, I heard one speak. And he started off, he said, if you want a 20 minute speech, might as well walk out right now. And he started to talk about the Holocaust. He all, I don't know if you know his story. Rabbi Lau, he was the chief rabbi in Israel who also survived the camp. And after he spoke, a woman got up crying and he said, she said, Rabbi, why did God punish me and left me alive? What, you, what would you answer? He, <laughs> he said, he left you alive because you should tell the story what went on. So you feel it's like a responsibility? I'm sorry? You feel almost as it's like a responsibility to tell her? I would say so. When did you begin to tell your story? Well, in the beginning, our dear Jews were not very nice to us, I must say. When you started to tell the story, <coughs> When you started to tell the story, they say, oh, how hard we had it. We had to work for $20 uh, uh, a week and so forth and so forth. So we said to ourselves, what's the sense to uh, 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 tell them? When I became president, like in any shul, there's machloikas. You know what that means? Yeah. So one day, I used to get up early and uh, another member came, you gotta come tonight to the show. They wanna impeach Johan. So I said, I get up early in the morning, then his, Joel's father said to me, if you don't go tonight, you uh, uh, can open up your mouth. P.S. I went the next election, there was a slate, and I said, before you vote, there are three conditions, a Holocaust library, a Kristallnacht, and a statue. And I think the vote was 90 to 10. And till today, we have, we have the three things going, Kristallnacht and everything. And I must say that Captain Levy, once I got my senses together, we were looking for him because I wanted to thank him what he did to me, that he saved, he saved my life. So we couldn't, in those days earlier, there was no computer or iPhone or whatever you want to call it. We couldn't find him. So one fine day, somebody in my other uh, son's shul found out that where he is and what he is, and then J.C. jumped in <coughs> with Rabbi Serna and another girl that worked, and they found the history of, Rabbi, of Captain Levy. And they, there was a here. You have a film here, Young Shoah, 2012, Frisch, 2012, uh, uh, Yom Shoah, a program. And 
uh, I think the, sh the, the school in, uh, invited his daughter and granddaughter, and we are still in touch with them. And, uh, what was it like? Um, actually, we're gonna hold here. We're gonna switch one more time. It's the last one. It's the last switch. No, you can stand. You can stay put for a moment, okay? Make yourself relax. You're finished with you? Oh, I think go. Okay. <laughs> More important to hear this. No, no. You started it. <laughs> okay. What did they say? Good. All right. <laughs> All right. So you good with your questions? <laughs> Great. Um, can you see where, where are we starting? I'm doing this one. We're doing these. And then this one I'm going to say, just put it into your school and then message, message. to general. And then we're just here. And then, yeah. and then we did this one already. We did the photos? No, we did the office one. 72 we did already. Yeah, I know we did. Uh, this one and this one. And that one. And then, let me, let me see if the last question is. I'll come these right are like backwards, yeah. like the, the bolder ones are yeah. right at the end. So we did, and these we covered already the past. You already counted all these? Yeah. Ask that one, because they asked about the skill points, but not the parents. Uh -huh. That's the last question to ask. Uh -huh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just letting you know, we can take this one off the table now. Yeah. You have your notes there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, real fast. Any questions? Okay, so you're gonna start with Tusha, you're gonna go to her, and then you're gonna go from there. Okay? Questions on audio? No? Just do the sound check. Right? Do the sound check, and I'm gonna double check. Oh, you heard before that, I'm gonna check focus. Okay. Change the number, Sammy. Oh. Okay. So Mr. we're going to do one more sound. We're going to do the last sound. Can you just count to 10 one more time, please? Ask him if you count another language. <laughs> no, seriously. In let's ask another language. Do you heard English too much. German. German. Mr. Let's ask German. Okay. Let's just want to yeah. count in German. Can you count, Can you count to 10, 10 in German? German? I'm sorry? Can you count to 10 for her in German? Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Kayla, Spanish? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Omar, could you go to 20? Go to 20. Doce, trece, catorce, dieciséis, diecisiete, dieciocho. A little bit lower. No, no. So, is she good? Yeah. Okay, then she's good. good. Right, open right. it, open it. Okay, so everybody ready? What did I say? All right, this is the last time. Huh? You don't have very much time. I know. So Names are. Go for it. Names on numbers Walter Spear, Frisch, take five. What was it like meeting Captain Levy's family? Uh, well, we.